command module is over here, and this is the actual autopulse band itself. So it's really simple. I'll go ahead and just toss a mannequin on there for the time being. <coughs> So I'll go ahead and turn it on. On off button is recessed. Keypad gives you the guides. And the machine does mechanical CPR. It's a soft, pliable band. And it's so light you can actually get your entire hand under there without doing any damage. Uh, a lot of times salespeople travel with the ping pong ball and put the ping pong ball under there. We all know how delicate ping pong balls are. It doesn't take much to dent them. You can put the ping pong ball under there, run for a good two, three minutes, take the ping pong ball out, not a darn bit of damage. It puts just a little bit of pressure, but what pressure it does use is evenly distributed amongst the patient's entire thoracic cavity. So, a flashback from the olden days when they had the thumper. The thumper just kept going up and down, up and down, up and down. It had no idea about the size of the patient. You would have to manually adjust the arm to compensate for the patient's size. And all it knew was push down X amount of inches and pull right back up. And it would keep on going. The problem is while you're driving, the patient's bouncing around, they're moving, they're getting diaphoretic, uh, they're sliding up and down off the board. Well, the thumper doesn't know that. It would just keep going and going. So essentially you start to get pneumothorax on, on one side or the other. Uh, you'd turn your eyes briefly and see the thing doing chest compressions on the patient's neck or on their belly, kind of over dramatic. But essentially the machine did not know what was going on. So to kind of, back, and it only did the anterior portion of the chest, only where the thumping portion would go. Uh, so sort of like manual CPR, we're only compressing a small portion of the chest and we're using an awful lot of strength and energy to do that. So what the autopulse does, I'll turn the fan off, the autopulse um, decompresses the entire chest cavity. And because we're moving the entire chest cavity, we don't have to press as hard, we don't have to go as deep, but we're moving much more blood flow than normal CPR. In fact, normal CPR is said to push between a quarter to a third of normal blood flow. The autopulse pushes quote unquote near normal blood flow in the upper 90 percentile. Uh, on most patients. So uh, when it does move and when it does move the patient, it moves very, very well. Uh, and as a result, where the AHA guidelines is two inches at 100 compressions a minute, we don't go quite two inches, we go 1.82. And we do not do 100 compressions a minute, we do 80. But we're still able to move much more blood volume than typical CPR. It's just a different way of doing things. The AHA addresses both this and uh, our, the, the Lucas device in the 2015 guidelines by saying refer to manufacturer recommendations for those devices. So when I take the board apart, you'll notice essentially there is a head mm -hmm. pointing this way. That's of course where the patient's head is supposed to go. Why do I point that out? It seems kind of obvious. I, I've, I've seen a lot of things in my years, just as you have, and uh, I've seen people coming upside down. So the patient's head goes here. You'll see that there's an outline of, of his or her torso. Torso should be here. Yellow line should be right under the armpit. So we're not too worried about the head being right on the head spot. What we're worried about is this yellow line being right across uh, uh, the chest, just below the armpit. Obviously, when you lay the patient on that board, you're not going to be able to see that yellow stripe. So when you lay the band across the patient's chest, that yellow stripe is continued across the top portion of what we call the CCA, the chest compression assembly. And this is essentially what will go up and down, but this yellow line always should be right under the axillary portion. So if it's too high or too low, we just need to stop and reposition our patient. Going back to how the older machines didn't know when the patient moved. This is a load sensor. It's going to measure the patient's weight, and if the patient's weight were to adversely shift one side or the other or up or down, the load sensor tells the autopulse, stop what you're doing, because there's a chance that we could cause patient damage. So everything centered on the autopulse is do no further harm. So if the patient moves or if the weight starts to distribute, the load sensor will sense that, and we'll stop chest compressions right away. Now, Electronics are great when they work. We all know that any mechanical device can fail. The last thing, again, the last thing we want to do is cause further damage. So right here on the end of the bands, you can actually, you'll be able to feel it. There's a breakable fusion link right there. If this fails, this is designed to, to 
break the band at a certain amount of chest pressure. So if the computer circuit doesn't sense that we're putting too much pressure on the patient's chest, the next thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna sacrifice the band to not for, do further damage. And that's why the band is a cloth material, allows that band to break easily as opposed to using something that's reusable that would just continue to do damage. There's handles all around the side which allow you when you go to position the patient to grab here and here um, to, to lift. So the way the auto press is normally deployed is people are doing CPR. You sit the patient up, one person at each side, you drag and lay them on the board. The head is here, yellow line. You just make sure the yellow line is right across the patient's chest or under the nipple line, great. One person places their side of the band on the patient's chest. The other person puts their band on the patient's chest. Who goes first? Well, it's numbered. Band number one goes first. Band number two goes second. The reason it's laid out like that is because the band is typically laid like that. Numbers are, numbers are facing upward. So number one, number two. You'll see there's a piece of yellow plastic that sticks up here. The band has Velcro on it, but Velcro over time can, can certainly wear. So that yellow piece of plastic helps to make sure that everything's nice and tight and snug and lined up where it should be. So once you align the band on the patient's chest, all you wanna do is pull up. Make sure there's no slack and do a quick visual on both sides to make sure that the band is not twisted. Everyone says, couldn't you come up with something a little bit better looking than, than this? Couldn't you do like a Zoll Blue or something? This is designed so if there's a twist, it's blatantly obvious whether, you can, whether you're colorblind or whether you're normal vision. Once all the slack is out, all you do is follow the buttons. You've got a green and a red, which we'll see in a minute. They're only illuminated when they're an option. So I have green, I can move forward. I can't stop what I'm doing, I'm not doing anything. When I press the green button, it's going to take all the slack out of the patient, out of the chest band. Essentially what it's just done is it's sized our patient's chest because unlike the thumper where you would just rest the, 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 the device on the patient's chest cavity and it would go up and down, we recognize that every patient's gonna be a different size and a different shape because we're all different circumference. So the autopulse has just measured our patient until it met resistance. The keypad then says, check alignment you got two options continue or stop so it's going to again gonna size the patient's chest I've got three seconds to make a decision start or if I don't make a decision it automatically starts doing compressions again the lights only illuminate when there's an option so we're moving I'm not gonna have a green light the only thing I can do is stop we have it set to 30 to 2. Just like when you're carrying someone down the steps, you only count 3, 2, 1. Ventilate, exhale, ventilate, and right when you're ready to exhale, the autopulse picks back up. The beeps are chest compressions 28, 29, 30, pause. So we'll give it a chance to do its thing. One breath in, out, second breath in, and right when you release. If you time your ventilations, one second in, one second out, one second in, matches up perfectly. The keypad has a green button, and a red button, and a gray button. The green and red are obvious, it's stop or start. The gray button is a miscellaneous button, and that gray button says switch to continuous. We happen to have an advanced airway placed. We don't need to pause ventilations um, for innovation. All I have to do is press that gray button. It switches from 30 to two to six, set to six to one. Ventilate, relax. Ventilate, relax, and you're good to go. At your two minute cycle, all you do is stop CPR analyze the underlying rhythm, deliver the shock if need be, or if a shock's not advised, green, green, and you're good to go. Because of the unique setup of the device, you know, the patient doesn't have to lay flat. We, we, we label this resuscitation on the move because inevitably you have to carry that patient down a set of stairs. You're going to have to set the stretcher up to move them around the corner. So 
the auto pulse can do chest compressions at uh, almost a 90 degree angle. And you're good to go. If the auto pulse ever stops, it's going to give you a message on the computer screen. You'll have a red light with the triangle. There's two types of error messages. User error, system error. System error, something failed internally, no matter what you do, that device is no longer gonna work. We don't see them too often. What we typically see is a user advisory. A user advisory is telling you something happened. So either the patient's weight shifted, we just want you to reconfirm, yes, the patient's in the right place, or perhaps we're in the late stages of cardiac arrest and the band is saying, hey, I'm meeting a little bit more resistance than I did before. In which case, the patient's probably starting to get rigored. We just want you to double check, lift the band up, let it go and restart. No matter what the problem is, no matter why it stops, a red light is always resolved the same exact way. You stop, lift up, lift down, green, green. No matter what the error message is, that's how you resolve it. <clears throat> if for some reason that does not resolve your issue, you stop what you're doing, you go back to manual CPR. Treat the patient, not the device. And I'm assuming that the pads are not going to interfere at all, right? No, your defib pads go right under the chest compression assembly just like they normally would. So everyone sees the styrofoam, that the foam outline of the defib pads, but under the foam there's tin. So it handles the chest compressions very, very well. Uh, if you're using the uh, if you're using the CPR feedback on the uh, on the X series, you've got two options. That accelerometer, you can leave it in place or take it off and stick it somewhere on the board where it's not bouncing up and down. Your choice. The battery is a sealed lithium ion. Our suggestion as a manufacturer is that whether the auto pulse gets used in that shift or not, every shift change the battery should be rotated. Uh, typically, if customers have problems with the auto pulse failing on scene of a call. Uh, there's actually a computer port in here that we can plug into. We normally find that the Autopulse battery hadn't been changed in several shifts or in some cases several weeks. The battery, even though it's not used, the Autopulse will draw some off the battery uh, whether it's used or not. So if you do nothing else and coming from a system that's used these since 2004, I can tell you flat out the biggest problem with the device is failing to remember to change the battery whether you use it or not. So just make that part of your daily user test. Battery comes out of the charger or out of the machine into the charger, your spare battery becomes your primary, your fresh battery comes off the charger, becomes your backup. So your backup battery is always the fresh one that's off the charger. So no matter what happens with this one, you know your fresh, your uh, most recent, your backup battery is fully charged, ready to go. When you go to put the battery in place, you're gonna meet a lot of resistance. There's a spring inside of there. Um, the best way to word it is don't be a sissy, put a little bit of oomph behind it and you'll hear it lock into place. There's a little metal clip that you can lower to stop the battery from inadvertently coming out. I've never seen that happen. It takes a lot of work to make that battery come out. So far? Great. Indications. Non-traumatic cardiac arrest uh, of FDA is approved for adult patients 18 years of age or older. Um, contraindications. Uh, based on protocol, Everyone feels that pregnancy may be a contraindication. Not necessarily. If you can move that band way up to where the baby's not being affected, you can still use it. Um, basically, you have to use some common sense. If there's any type of penetrating injury to the torso, since this puts out near normal blood flow, you're going to cause a lot of internal bleeding. Or if you believe that the patient's had a AAA, uh, from here up they're completely purple, uh, the, and the face looks like Elmer's glue, probably not a good idea. You're just going to help them bleed out that much quicker. Um, some medical directors are okay with, tra with traumatic injury as long as it's not to the torso. So fractured arms, fractured legs, that's all up to medical direction. Questions so far? Battery should last roughly 30 minutes. You'll have an indicator on here that shows you what the battery level is off to the left hand side. You'll see the battery starting to deplete as patient care continues. We normally give you a low battery warning when there's about five minutes left, plenty of time to secure another battery. This does not plug into AC power, where it's totally battery dependent, so you always want to make sure that you have a second battery. I saw you were going to say something. Do you have like the like skid stops on the back of it? To where Good it'll question. Sit on, a, on a backboard? 
So we've been there before. I was skid say, stops right over here. Grip on it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, and there's more skid stops over here. So these stop are going up and down. These stop are going side to side. Now, you had specifically mentioned backboard. Yeah. So there are devices that do mechanical CPR in the market um, that are a lot lighter than the autopulse and smaller. The thing is, they all need to have a backboard. The patient's got to be laying flat. Sure. So where, where this comes into play is the autopulse doesn't necessarily need uh, a backboard. The patient does not have to lay flat. All we, need, all we need straight is the torso. And unless your patient's got a lot of rib fractures and a spinal fracture or they got hinges in the middle of the chest, the torso is always going to lay flat. So what we do is we position the autopulse on what we call a soft stretcher. So when you go to deploy the autopulse, it comes, this is rolled up, and your autopulse comes like this. So when someone's doing CPR, you put this beside the patient, you unclip, open, open, sit the patient up, put the autopulse underneath them, lay them back, and then basically this is folded up under the autopulse. You get one person on each side, you pull. This comes out under the patient's legs. This is what you use to, uh, to, use the, uh, to move the patient. So most, most uh, plastic or polyurethane backboards are about eight to nine pounds. Coincidentally, the difference between this and other mechanical CPR devices on the market is about seven to 10 pounds. So it puts it right there in the ballpark. So what's that way? That unit? Uh, believe with the battery right about 23, 24. Okay. That's not including the bag. I'm sure the bag probably weighs two or three pounds. It's not, uh, it's not light. Now the advantage is when you've got a patient, and we'll fool around this here in a little bit, is when you got a patient on the, hmm, a lot of trailers or module homes, mo uh, modular homes in the area, Ethel always codes between the toilet and the wall. It never fails. And our stretchers aren't gonna fit down that hallway. So the nice thing is when you get Ethel on the, uh, on, uh, the, the soft stretcher, you go down to the feet, you can drag her through the entire trailer like this. And when you get to a corner where you have to make a 90 degree turn, all you do is lift his or her feet up, spin them around like this, that spins on the carpet, and you're just fine. So you can feel free to go downstairs, you can make 90 degree turns. Uh, with the backboard, you can't do that. And uh, as time goes on, we'll even do a couple scenarios. We'll, we'll lay it on the floor, we'll deploy it, and we'll maybe go down the hallway, we'll make a 90 degree turn or something. Last. Once you get the patient on the autopulse, and let me go ahead and put this up here. So at some point in time, you're probably gonna to wanna to transport. The best advice I can give you is remember when I told you that if the autopulse stops, it's trying to tell you something. The most common cause of the The most common cause of the autopulse stopping is that the patient's back somehow gets lifted off the board. So for example, with the soft stretcher, when you go to lift his or her feet, it's not uncommon for the small of their back to arch a little bit and stop them from coming off the board. During transport, your driver makes a sharp turn, it's not uncommon for the torso to shift a little bit. So we give you a set of these, a NASCAR harness. Patient, hold on for dear life. Um, I'm gonna let this out a little bit. Again, this is only for when you decide that you're gonna transport the patient. This is gonna help keep his or her torso situated on the board. It's real simple. Yellow goes to yellow. All you do is clip, clip. The black ones go here. There's two wire hooks, clip. Clip and pull down, the blacks are normally pretty good the way they are, pull down on the yellow. Make sure that when you secure the chest, that you secure the chest, not the band. You don't want the strap being on top of the band. And you're good to go after that. Some departments choose not to use that. It depends on what kind of path you have to the hospital. If you got a straight path where you're not twisting and turning down the roads, it might not be a problem. Um, but most people that have been using it without that, when you show them that, they notice a lot less interruptions in CPR because the patient's torso is pretty much held down to the board, make the two one. How big does that harness get? Oh, it's, uh, if your patient's corn fed and built for distance, not for speed, this thing gets, uh, this thing gets pretty, uh, pretty big. So I'll just do this, this one particular size.
gets gets to be pretty decent size and it goes out sideways remember all we need to do is just hold down we're not trying to you know we're not trying to get wire ties and cinch them all the way down to all four corners of the board just trying to keep the two mostly to keep the torso from shifting from side to side is the, is the band is that disposable or is that reusable? the band is one time single patient use the cloth is going to start to to wear but remember it's cloth for a reason for it to break open should there be an issue um, this can absorb medications IV fluids, spit, sputum, blood. So this is single patient use um, changing. Take this off real quick. The band comes in an entire package like this. Notice how it comes with the black piece of plastic in back. So when you go to change the band, all you do is unclip, unclip, squeeze. This whole thing is disposable. I can't tell you how many times I tried to save this piece of plastic only to remember, whoops, it's not savable. All you do is grab these two pieces. There's a white disc. You push down on the disc. This entire thing is tossed in the trash. Your new one's going to come just like this. For training purposes, we do have a reusable band that we can use as complete nylon so you don't have to keep throwing these things out. Um, but you grab your new band, all you do is put that peg back in the slot. I'm upside down, it goes in the slot, locks into place, you open this back up and just lock it down. One, two, clip, clip, you're good to go. Make the egg whole. That's how you know you have the right size up.